Hello, and welcome to the Turchin Center for the Visual Arts Virtual Art Talk Series. I'm Christy Chanowski, Director of Arts Education and Outreach at the Turchin Center. We're located on the campus of Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. I'd like to acknowledge that the land we work on is land traditionally owned by the Cherokee people. I say this as a way to remember the story of our community and to stand alongside our Cherokee neighbors. We at the Turchin Center are committed to providing engaging and educational content to accompany our dynamic art exhibitions. While current health restrictions have changed a lot about how we present our work, it has not changed our mission to engage learners in and through art. We hope you find our virtual content inspiring. Thank you for taking the time to engage with our work and with other art supporters who, like you, are inspired and uplifted by the visual arts. Matthew Arnold is an American photographer and his work has been exhibited and promoted widely in galleries and museums across the United States and around the world, including London, England, Venice, Italy, and Guatemala. Recent projects include a monograph entitled Topography is Fate, North African Battlefields of World War II and Ghosts and Longing for Amelia. Awards and honors include being named a Museum of Fine Arts Boston Traveling Fellow, as well as a top 50 emerging photographer by Lens Culture. Arnold was also an exhibitor at the Valid Photo Gallery in Barcelona, Spain. He was recently named a Photo Lucida 2020 Critical Mass Top 50 Photographer for the second time, this time for his Amelia Earhart project. Arnold studied photography at the West Surrey College of Art and Design in London, England, and is a graduate of the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts. He was also a visiting lecturer at Columbia University in New York City in 2015, and Arnold currently lives and works in Los Angeles, California. So thank you for being here with us this evening, Matthew. Um, would you like to share a little more about yourself and the project? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for uh, coming to uh, or joining in at this uh, talk. Uh, just a brief uh, sort of background about me. I, uh, was born in Ohio, spent time there, but also uh, actually grew up uh, in part in North Carolina outside of uh, Charlotte and Monroe. So I spent my high school years down there. So I had and spent a lot of the time, actually a lot of my time in uh, the, the mountains of North Carolina during the summers. Uh, so I, I know the area quite well. So it was, it was pretty great to be able to actually have an exhibition at the Turchin Center right in Boone. Uh, so that that's pretty fantastic. Anyway, um, more of my history. I, uh, as as Shauna said, I went to college in Boston at the School of Museum of Fine Arts. That's where I spent most of my uh, college years. Spent a little bit of time uh, in London uh, or outside London at the other school, but a very short period of time. Spent more time traveling around uh, Europe during that period and uh, photographing there. So that was. Uh, the education that I got was uh, mostly more of uh, traveling around Europe at that point. But um, from that perspective, uh, that was a you know a big influence of uh, of me continuing in the the work of landscape photography. It was uh, that the summer spent traveling around uh, North Carolina, uh, traveling uh, or <laughs> waking up early uh, and on canoe trips in the tidewaters of Virginia, I spent some time there as well when I was growing up. Um, all of those elements were pretty uh, important to the uh, notion of the work that I'm doing now, just in the sense that uh, it was um, um, being able to see landscapes and begin to photograph at that time period was uh, influential in, in uh, what I'm doing, I think now. Awesome. And I think that kind of leads in nicely to a question that I always try to ask right. people who work in the photographic medium, why photography? You know, what made you fall in love with light and the photographic process so much that you would dedicate so much of your time to it? Yeah, um, uh, like I said, previously just said that, you know, growing up around the landscapes of North Carolina and, and the tidewaters of Virginia was very influential. Um, waking up early uh, at, at early at, at sunrise to to uh, go canoeing with uh, with my family was uh, uh, a big part of I think the way I see light uh, and was influenced by that. Uh, my uncle also is a uh, a 
wildlife photographer. Uh, he lives out in New Mexico. Um, so learning a lot from him for sure. Uh, but I, I think I got my first camera when I was about 12 or, or 13. It was a disc camera. I don't know if anybody remembers a disc camera, but it was a, a small little uh, point and shoot type uh, camera with a very small uh, piece of film, uh, almost too small to even hold in your hand, but it was held by this disc uh, structure, uh, which was fun when I was when I was very young. So I think my mother got me that when I was very young. Uh, that was the first camera I got. And then uh, on those trips around the South um, with uh, my stepfather and mother and family, um, I would sometimes use my stepfather's uh, 35 millimeter camera. So that was uh, a, a big influence of in photography. And then from there, um, high school, I just wanted to continue um, photographing. And so I think that's what really uh, got me uh, interested in going to art school after high school uh, and uh, looked around uh, to try to find the right school for me. Uh, the museum school or the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston was uh, really key uh, to, you know, really, I guess, honing what I really wanted to do. Uh, um, so in, in that regard, that, that uh, pulled me uh, even further closer to the landscape, even though I, the funny thing is, is I was doing more studio work at, at, at the museum school. Um, but I think that that doing the studio work actually um, showed me that what I really wanted to be doing was working within the landscape itself and, and continuing the idea of, of of, of landscape. I hadn't really thought about it from the history perspective, which is what I'm doing now, but uh, landscape photography was really, uh, I think, key when I got out of school. Um, yeah. So can you expand on that a little bit and tell us about, you know, your work up to this point and how you started weaving in the connection with the historical significance of the topography of land and the individuals who interact with it? Yeah, um, you know, I, I like I said, I was I was just photographing, you know, landscapes. There wasn't any uh, specific context or um, conceptual idea of what the work was. It was um, you know, documenting the things that I that I see, uh, and that included, um, I guess, the traditional landscape, but also uh, landscapes within cities and things of that sort. So it didn't have a specific uh, uh, overall overarching idea. Um, what changed all that was me traveling to Egypt. I went to a friend's wedding and um, then after the wedding spent a, a week or so in the desert and I immediately fell in love with the desert. Uh, I had really not experienced a, a desert before and so the that was uh, the, the North African desert was just uh, stunning. And I wanted to go back uh, and photograph uh, North Africa, um, but I didn't, at that point, I didn't wanna go back and just photograph uh, the landscapes. I wanted to have an, uh, a project or something that would align with, uh, the, with, with history or, or with humanity or in, in some respect. And funnily enough, was sitting uh, on a bar stool in, in New York City, talking to a friend that has a, a strong, uh, interest in history as do I and we were talking about a book he was reading um, and it really it essentially was all about America's involvement in World War II um, and I started reading the book myself and, was, and I thought to myself this is the perfect project this gives me the ability of traveling all across North Africa uh, because, and no one has really photographed these landscapes before uh, these they're they're in fact, many places probably people hadn't visited, uh, be, being that they're they're so far removed from uh, cities or what have you, that many places hadn't been visited since probably that that era of time. And so it, I started working on that first project, Topography is Fate, which is uh, the history of uh, of um, World War II in North Africa. So documenting the different battlefields uh, across North Africa, in specifically Tunisia, uh, Egypt, and um, uh, Libya. 
Um, so that was really the first project that brought together history with photography, specifically landscape photography. So that was uh, the key element that really changed everything in, in how I, I saw my work and, and uh, how it uh, how I was going to work in the future, for sure. I mean, I remember, you know, I, I spent about a year or so researching the project and I found a, a amateur historian um, based in England who I uh, aligned with and began working with. Uh, he had lots of uh, research already done from you know, different battle maps uh, and, and maps of, of the region that we could use for me to travel around and, and, and document these battlefields. Um, and so you, you're, you're standing in some places that have key sort of points that you know are, uh, or a battle actually took place there, whether it's pockmarks on uh, the side of a building or actual trenches that you can still see, but some places didn't have any of those elements. Um, and those, are, those were the places that were really, funnily enough, inspiring because you didn't really know until you began to do a little, in fact, dig a little. And you, I would pick up a piece of shrapnel and then you'd find a, a bullet shell, and then you'd uh, uh, find other elements that uh, would would make you yourself aware that you were standing on a, a, a field of battle, and that was truly inspiring because you knew that something monumental took place here, and people possibly lost their lives here, and uh, that that feeling is really what. Uh, hammered home the idea of creating this work or creating work in general about history and, and uh, our, our influence as, as humans on the landscape. Yeah, thank you. And we have a question from Greg Kosky who asks why landscape and why landscapes instead of people? Um, and I think he touched a little bit on that, but I wonder if you've ever considered portraiture or anything in your work. There was a time where I was doing more portraiture, um, but um, I've always found the peacefulness of the of the landscape to be what really draws me in. Um, I, I think I'm more of uh, that type of I have that type of personality that's that does enjoy uh, being on my own, being out in 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 these places, and really uh, finding uh, finding that. Um, that quiet uh, being out there documenting these places. So I think that the quiet is, is one of the main draws to doing this work It's that adventure of, of finding places that others haven't been to or um, um, you know, the, the far reaches of the world that still are uh, obviously been explored but not explored by me uh, and maybe not explored by many people. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the, it's the the quietness, the the adventure, the that feeling of of really exploring something um, that's um, far flung, I guess. <laughs> gotcha. And Ellen Slavic asks, who I believe ha shared um, exhibited some of her work in the same gallery not too long huh. ago. Um, who are your biggest influences in photography? Um, I guess it would say that, that from a, a movement standpoint, it would be the new topographic, uh, that, that movement of, of, of again, <laughs> it's, a, it's a landscape uh, movement, it's a, it's a, it, but it's very quiet in the perspective of, of the photographer's eye. So you are, are, you're seeing through the lens of someone, but the influence of that person's eye, that photographer's eye is, is not clearly shown. It's a it's a it's a, a simple um, frame, uh, and I, I think I, from that perspective, that's uh, probably my biggest influence. Um, that's what really the idea of that style, that that simplicity, uh, again the quiet, is is what draws me. And I say that that's probably my biggest influence um, when it comes to um, the work that I'm doing now with with incorporating of of sculptural elements, constructions, uh, drawings. Uh, it's probably Ed Russia. Uh, um, his work is 
pretty influential to me in the sense of it's taking uh, photography as, as some level of its base and then creating, I guess, a, a more, more graphical elements uh, to uh, apply on top of or to be a part of the, the photography in some regard. Uh, a, a lot of his work does have, you know, a, a big photo photographic in, uh, beginnings and then moves from that and vice versa. It, you know, I, I think he's probably uh, been uh, working in, in the opposite direction as well. Uh, but it's those two, I think, are probably the key influences that, that are uh, with me right now, at, at least. Thank you. And looking at the work that's at the Turchin Center, can you tell us a little bit about your motivation behind taking on the subject of Amelia Earhart's disappearance? You know, what inspired you to create such a passionate body of work about this story that's captivated so many people for over eight decades? Yeah, um, it's uh, it. Obviously, we all grew up learning about uh, all the, <laughs> the great things that she did and uh, being the first woman, well, one of the first women to do uh, many of the things that she did, but certainly the first one to um, try to do these mon monumental uh, aspects of flight. Um, but the influence really came from that first project of the topography is fade is like once I realized that I wanted to continue the work of uh, or incorporating history into my work, um, I, I needed to find another subject really is what it came down to. And at some point during the end of the topography is fate project, I read an article about um, one of the theories of her disappearance. And it was something that I didn't know about before. Um, I always just assumed as I think probably the overarching theory is that she just crashed into the ocean and uh, was never seen again, ran out of fuel, crashed into the ocean never, and was never seen again. But once I read that article, I was like, oh, this is fascinating. And uh, I think probably that article mentioned some other theories and I began to do more, you know, I began to look into it and thought maybe that this could be my next project. Um, for one, it um, would take me to a whole different landscape to photograph. Uh, obviously, the North Africa stuff was is mostly desert work, um, but these would be um, islands in the middle of the Pacific, uh, where all of the theories uh, are, for the most part, uh, based. Uh, so it that idea, and then also just the, the idea of Amelia Hurt and having that be sort of the jumping off point uh, for the project. The historical aspect of that, um, of her, uh, was really what inspired me to continue or to, to start this project. So it was that combination of being able to go to a, you know, a, a completely different landscape to, to photograph. Uh, and again, that adventure of, of uh, trying to travel to islands that very few people have ever uh, stepped foot on. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that was the, that was one of the really key aspects was to that continuation of, of history uh, as part of my work. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. And you write about, you know, how long periods of introspection can shift your perspective on your work and your process and contributes to quote a deeper understanding of how obstructions in the path of life can ultimately lead to a different and possibly more revelatory direction in the creative development of the artist. Can you expand on this and share some examples of how obstructions in the path of your longing for mm -hmm. project inspired the work in the gallery? Yeah, uh, this project requires a lot of research um, and then requires a lot of, I guess, uh, governmental hoop jumping, uh, cutting through red tape. Um, and then the the places are so far removed um, that they're, they're difficult to access. Um, and I come across or come up against uh, some issues with regards to this, what was supposed to be the first phase. The first phase was originally going to be to travel to uh, the Phoenix Islands um, and had spent about a year and a half to, um, to research, to uh, find 
uh, someone that could take me to uh, the, the, the islands uh, there essentially would be completely inaccessible by airplane or any other means other than uh, traveling by boat uh, to get there. Uh, and so I had to hire a boat and a captain uh, and it, we were going to spend about 20 days on the water to go to, to uh, the different islands that uh, surrounded her, her disappearance. So uh, to be specific, Howland Island. Howland Island was where she was uh, supposed to refuel after having take, taken off from Lai, New Guinea. Uh, she was supposed to land on Howland, which is this tiny speck of land in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, it's, so it would be almost like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Um, and so to access these places, like I said, required uh, a, a lot of work. Uh, and I had gotten to the point of hiring a captain, hiring a boat, and um, had <laughs> traveled to uh, Samoa, uh, where we were supposed to meet and travel along to, uh, to the, the islands in the, Fe in the Phoenix Islands. Um, when, when it all fell through. Uh, the, the, it's a long story, but I'll make it brief. But uh, the captain had hired a, a carpenter to do work on the boat. And um, he didn't pay the carpenter. The carpenter sued in local Samoan court and got the boat impounded. This all took place, this last bit all took place while I was there in, uh, in Samoa. And so half, after having spent a year and a half uh, doing all this research and um, trying to raise the money for the funding of this, uh, it all came crashing down around me. Um, and I had gotten a grant for this project and the grant required me to do work for the project. And so what transpired from that was, well, obviously I can't do the work that I wanted to do. So I'm going to do work that's, that's different. Uh, that's, that's about the, the process. But not specifically about uh, this uh, the the travel in the landscape photography. So some of these drawings and some of the constructions actually came out of that. So that adversity of not being able to go to the place it it forced me into forced uh, is a strong word, but it it compelled me to create a different type of work that I would not have uh, done had it not be for all that took place in in Samoa, uh, so that is really the the you know the key to, is is key to uh, me uh, becoming a, a a different type of artist, and uh, it's it's inspiring in that regard uh, because I never would have uh, begun this the the other elements of the project without uh, that difficulty. Uh, to, to move it in that direction. So, and from that, uh, this is, it's going to be a, a significant part of the work that I do from now on. Um, I, I, I'll continue the work in, in the his, historic realm, uh, but I'm also also pushing into um, doing more scientific aspects uh, within my work as well. So uh, different uh, historical scientific um, um, projects will, be coming as well. And so those elements will be um, created uh, or the, that combination or the, the alignment of the work with science and history will be uh, created through more of the multimedia type uh, pieces that I am, am showing at the Turgeon. Yeah, thank you. And speaking of obstructions in the path of life, how has COVID impacted your practice? What have you been up to these past few months or I guess a year now? <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's funny. I'll have been in LA for a year, I think on Friday. <laughs> so I moved two days uh, before everything locked down. I moved from New York City two days before everything locked down. Um, so the past year has been spent uh, really looking at LA. Um, it's really, it's really fascinating to see and, and actually looking at more, uh, Los Angeles based artists, uh, as well, because it's a, it's, 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 it's funny how clear, how, uh, how a city or how a region can influence, I think the way that people see, um, I'm, or 
the things that I'm seeing are, are the more, the more black and white photographers that are showing the, that with the black and white imagery, it's, it's showing the, the, the brightness of the sunshine that is prevalent, the, the, the whiteness really of, of things because the sun is so bright. So the concrete is, you know, it, or the buildings themselves are, are just so bright against uh, these uh, soft pale skies in, in these black and white photographs is one example. So seeing different, uh, I've, I'm spending my time really uh, looking at uh, the artists, more local artists to, to uh, be inspired by them. Um, but also, you know, walking as much as I can I, uh, and photographing uh, as much as I can, but uh, not as much as I would have hoped to be doing in this first year. But, um, but yeah, that's been the main thing and <laughs> writing a lot of grant proposals. Uh, you're, you know, you're stuck inside and uh, you uh, have to spend the time and I want to continue the work uh, that I'm doing. So grant proposals are a, a big, big part of it. And unfortunately, it's, uh, it's time consuming and it's tedious, but um, I'm, I'm getting good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, can you tell us a little bit about um, the behind the scenes of your trip to the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. What was the process of planning and embarking on that particular site visit like? Yeah, with all of this, it's, um, you know, it's, it takes time. There's, it takes a lot of planning up front. Um, it, you try to figure out what, uh, with with this specific project, there are multiple theories to her disappearance. So there's there's theories that involve, like I said, the the Phoenix Islands. There's theories that involve the Marshall Islands and and the Mariana Islands. That this phase of the project is. There's theories that are based in Papua New Guinea. Um, so it, initially, it was just trying to figure out what was going to be the most viable uh, and most um, manner by which I, I could use the, the stage that this is to get to the next stage of the or phase of the project. Um, with the Marshall Islands, it was, uh, I guess, trying to find the right people that uh, I would need to, uh, to make the project successful. And that was um, reaching out to the the key players uh, that hold the theory specific to uh, the, the Marshall Islands um, and reaching out to them, um, having discussion, um, getting them involved or hoping that they'd get involved because I really want the projects that I work on to be um, to be influenced by them as well because it's their theory in this, in this specific uh, um, phase. Uh, so I want them to have a, a an influence in in the work itself because they're going to be the ones that are going to take me to the ex exact spots, for instance, where uh, they they found the uh, the what they say is the, the we believe the is the wheel cover of uh, her plane. And actually, what we're looking at right now is the site where uh, um, Dick Spink uh, found the wheel cover uh, to. Uh, her airplane. Um, uh, so having them involved, uh, including them in the, the journey, including them in the travel, uh, including them in the process is, is key. So that's where I start is, is starting to, uh, by reaching out to them, doing my own research, reaching out to them, and then obviously putting in motion all of the, the travel and planning uh, aspects to it. It's, it's obviously takes a, a good amount of time. It's, it, this was an easier process, this specific phase, because um, he, uh, Dick Spink had a lot of, uh, had already made friends in <laughs> the Marshalls. And so it was really uh, uh, pretty simple to put together a, a team that we could, we could use to get to these places because these islands uh, are uninhabited, most of them. Uh, so I needed, uh, again, a boat and a captain, and he had people there that uh, were able to, to, to do this for me. We, we would spend uh, about a week or so out on the water uh, and then head back to, uh, to the, the main island uh, to refuel and resupply. And then we'd spend a couple of days and then go back out for uh, another week. Um, so, uh, I spent about a, a month in the Marshalls, um, 
traveling this way to the different islands that uh, I needed to go to so that I could uh, document the different uh, things that I wanted to document. Yeah, and what was it like being in that space, you know, emotionally and physically after doing so much planning and research beforehand and finally embarking uh, on this adventure? Well, <laughs> with this, it was, it was, uh, invigorating because the last uh, attempt at the project failed miserably in, in the sense of not being able to actually get to the, to the place that I wanted to go and raising the amount of money that I had to raise to get there was uh, pretty significant. So to be able to successfully um, accomplish this phase was um, really important to the psyche and uh, important to the project itself. So uh, the way that I sort of see this is that, you know, the, the, the first phase is going to be the key influencer in how the next phases will build out and also how they'll be funded, how the next phases will be funded. Um, so the idea of being able to accomplish uh, this first phase was really important. And, um, and being in these places, being specifically being in these places, are just it's unbelievable i mean the landscapes the seascapes themselves the every every aspect of it meeting the people uh that live on some of these uh smaller islands um all of those elements are really um <laughs> in, inspiring um to be able to camp on these islands where no one else <laughs> is around uh and listen to the the you know the waves uh lapping on the shore um waking up to you know 180 degree uh, rainbows um, and the sun rises uh, where, you know, there's, there's no sound except uh, what is in front of you. Um, and uh, all of those feelings of, of quiet and uh, peacefulness are really, uh, really inspiring. Yeah. And how did you decide where and what to make pictures of on the islands? You know, how did your own personal connection of being in that landscape influence the images you were making? Um, it, you don't really know until you get there uh, is really what it comes down to is, uh, you know, you, I, I do as much research as I can to have some understanding of what the island vegetation is and, and what they might look like. Um, but until you're in those places, you don't really know what is going to um, inspire you to, to, to snap the shutter. Um, some cases it's the light flowing through uh, the, the, the palm trees or, or it's uh, what's on the ground. It's the moss that is uh, growing on so many different things. Uh, it's the amazing blue of the ocean. It's the, the you know, sometimes the, the rough weather on, on the seas, it's um, the, the, the skies that go on forever, the clouds that uh, bill, billow up what seems like thousands of miles. It's just, it's intense. It's things that I've never seen before. And so it's all of those, uh, all of those things are really uh, drive uh, me to, to photograph. And, you know, I photograph thousands of images when I'm there and only a few make the cut, but um it's um and it's and it's also a struggle so you know you're in environments that are really inhospitable to cameras and other equipment um whether it be rain or uh sea salt or salt spray or whatever um so there's just uh, all of these things that influence how you photograph and um what you choose is uh you know key to the to the project itself you know you want to you, you want to capture the key elements of the story so i you know I, I map out some things that i think that i will photograph um so that i i can hopefully tell the the right story and, and get the uh overall feeling and uh um and, and this you know physical story told uh but um but yeah, it's it's a uh, once you get there and you see the things that you never expected, like this arc that seemed to be formed by uh, this is a reef uh, on one of the islands, um, and that arc uh, formed by I guess the water receding uh, every day when the tide goes out is is uh, 
it's it's just one of those things that uh, you obviously don't expect until you're actually walking along the shore. Thank you. And we have a question from Ann Kosky, who wants to know, uh, kind of going back when you were describing your impressions of witnessing the quiet North African deserts and battlefields, can you compare that to the quiet witnessing, quiet of witnessing Gettysburg? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it is, it's certainly going to have the same similarity. I mean, people are going to be uh, inspired in their own ways of, of, of uh, when they when they are experiencing these these places, um, I think the the difference might be that you've spent time traveling to these places, uh, or specifically in North Africa, in the in the in the back of a, a you know a four by four, uh, and you spent hours driving across the desert uh, to get to these to get to these sites. So there's, there's something that, you know, there's a, a feeling of, um, what's the word, I guess, uh, you, you, you're, you're, it's building up the emotion, I guess, is it, it has a tendency to build up when you know, you're going to go to a specific site that you know, the history of, and maybe that's, you know, similar, uh, when, uh, we're talking about Gettysburg or, or what have you, but for me, um, you know, you, you're not driving on a, a road uh, that's that's paved and and different elements that are you know that give you the awareness of the modern world. You're almost uh, you know you're you're experiencing almost maybe what <laughs> the other person the the soldier that was there uh, was experiencing because all you, what you see is is the desert around you uh, and. Uh, that I think might be a, a slight difference between uh, what someone might experience with traveling to Gettysburg, uh, but but yeah, I think that would might for me that that the idea of that travel to get to that place and the uh, what you might find when you get there is is um, pretty um, pretty inspiring. Yeah, and Ellen Slavic wants to know: Do slash did you consider? Um, U.S. military political presence and activity, like nuclear testing and displacement in places like the Marshall Islands. Um, it's it's obviously it's a very very uh, big problem there. Um, all, all of the the testings that were that were done uh, by the U.S. government. Um, it's not part of the project. Um, I think because it's it maybe veers a little bit uh, a few steps away from what I was um, attempting to uh, accomplish with the project, but certainly, I mean, I, I it was something that I considered and and thought about, and uh, but it, it didn't become part of this project. Gotcha. Thanks. And some really kind of looking at this drawing um, and thinking about your artistic interventions in the way of your sculptural pieces in the exhibition, there are a few different styles of sculpture. Um, you, know, you have the steel flight path study and the depictions of the islands, and then you have a wooden block grid and both of these acrylic pieces. And I'd love to hear you share the stories behind each of those works. Yeah. Um, the for instance, this drawing is inspired by uh, an actual search grid uh, that was done after. Uh, so I've, I'm, I'm actually blanking on the Nautilus. Nautilus is the team that uh, their theory is that she did crash in the ocean and they think that they can find her plane uh, it, it, around Howland Island. Uh, which is where she was supposed to land, refuel, and then go on to Hawaii and then Oakland, California. So it was three more legs of her trip and she would have completed her around the world uh, travel. Uh, this specific dr drawing is influenced by the search grid from, uh, I think it's the Nautilus team, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head. Um, so th this inspi was inspired by those drawings that they had done to create a mapping of the sea floor uh, so that they could determine whether or not there was any uh, 
sort of, I guess, uh, breakup or, or uh, mechanical uh, looking thing on the on the sea floor. Uh, from there, this actually inspired the uh, the sculpture of the uh, three um, acrylic uh, pieces. Uh, so that so it's sort of a, a uh, one influencing the next. So if, if you want to scroll down to the, uh, I forget if they're up at the top or they're at the, I think they're at the end. If you quickly scroll through, you can see the, um, the acrylic sculpture. That's one, keep going. Yeah, so there's this. So that initial drawing that I did uh, inspired this. I wanted to try to think about this in a more three-dimensional way because Obviously, the that mapping is mapping the the depth of the ocean as well. Uh, so these these structures are uh, meant to sort of be influenced by the idea of the depth of the ocean. Um, so it's, it's each one of the, each one of the different uh, sculptural pieces have some uh, either scientific or or uh, influence from the, the, the search uh, or the understanding of what possibly happened to uh, Earhart. Uh, for instance, the steel sculpture, um, or the, the steel, yes, that one, uh, that is influenced by uh, the study of fuel consumption and how far uh, the, her plane could have flown um, and which route she would have taken based on the, and, and based on the amount of fuel that she would have burned uh, getting to Howland Island and whether the weather had any influence on uh, how much fuel she would have consumed and uh, what path she would have taken um, because of the weather and because of the amount of fuel that she would have, she would need to get to those places. So there's an, there's uh, an influence from the science, from the, the study of trying to understand what happened to her. So utilizing all of the different things that they can know, uh, this happened in 1937. So there's some limitations to what uh, information that is available to um, the people that are searching for her. But nonetheless, these the, the sculptures have some understanding or, or, or taken from the studies that are, are, are done to try to determine what actually could have happened to her. Gotcha. And Suzanne Stokes wants to know, did you find any new information to add to the research around Amelia? No, uh, I, I, the, the, it really is, uh, the project is not so much to find new information, it's, it's really to, uh, to talk about the the different theories uh, of her disappearance, to um, to really highlight the people, the 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 theories that actual people are uh, spending hours, uh, years of their life uh, to to determine what happened to her. So it it. In the end, the project, I think once, like I said, this is the first phase of the project that is, has been accomplished. And so I think with the end product, once it's all completed, I want to include the people that are uh, involved in each of the different theories because they've dedicated their uh, significant portions of their lives to these, to these theories, to, to trying to find what happened to this iconic figure in, um, in the, in our in our history is in America, so it's it's uh, it's pretty um, an important um, project in their lives, and so I want to highlight that as well. Absolutely, and looking at this picture of the gallery, your photos in the show are exhibited in frames without glass or acrylic, uh, exposing the print it, without that barrier. Um, 
or the separation that we're so used to seeing with photographic work. And can you speak to that artistic decision and how you hope it affects the way that viewers interact with your work and kind of what you hope viewers will take away from experience yeah. with your work? Yeah, it's, it's, it is what you just said, it's a barrier. I, I, the acrylic is just so, uh, it, <laughs> it bothers me. <laughs> it, it keeps the, the viewer from really seeing the detail of the, of the prints. Um, and that's, you know, something that I've, it really happened when it, it's sort of a, not so much an accident, but uh, when I was exhibiting the topography as fate work, I couldn't afford to, uh, you also do, a, I was obviously hanging a large show and wanted to have two large, very large prints for the exhibition, um, but couldn't afford to do a, a, the large framed print with acrylic. Um, and so uh, I chose not to use the acrylic and was stunned by how different uh, it, it looked uh, without the acrylic. It really, um, it, it almost that the it's it's at, like adding gloss <laughs> to the acrylic is is almost adding gloss and so it, it you sometimes are going to miss some of the the detail uh, in the print uh, and the subtlety and the and the, the softness of of color and and light in the in the prints themselves um, adding that that acrylic uh, yeah it's a little bit dangerous because anyone could sneeze and uh, <laughs> cause the issue with the print but nonetheless it's it that barrier is is pretty significant and I love my I love my prints when there's no acrylic on on covering them up because it it really uh, it, it's uh, allows for the softness of the the colors and textures to really uh, be seen more clearly I think yeah it definitely does impact the way you experience the work and looking at the archival materials you've chosen you've taken so much care into replicating those as well and I'd I'd love to know more about how you interact with the idea of the archive um, through the project and obviously you've done a lot of research and excavating and how did you decide which archives to explore and was it difficult to gain access to any of those? It wasn't, it wasn't difficult. Um, it was, uh, you know, it's obviously just initially just doing a search <laughs> on the in general internet. And then, um, you know, I knew of some places, I knew that uh, Purdue uh, University had a lot of things uh, in that, uh, surrounding Amelia Earhart. I assumed the National Archives uh, had the same, and they both did. Uh, so they were; th those are the key places uh, of uh, of research, and everything is online, or at least most things are online. Um, the things that I, I I felt that I needed were were online, and uh, accessing them, they were each of those places were very helpful uh, in uh, allowing me to to use uh, the giving me permission to actually use the the, the different pieces that are here they're, they're not actual um the the actual archival documents <laughs> they are uh they are prints of the or copies duplicates of uh those documents um at some point i i would really love to have the actual documents uh within an exhibition um but I think that that's going to be a little bit down the road uh, and would most likely be, if, if there were going to be an exhibition, it would probably be in those in one of those places where you know, there was less uh, issue of, of having those, the actual documents uh, to leave the, the, the institutions. So, but yeah, it was pretty uh, straightforward and, and simple in, uh, having access to these and getting the permission to actually use them. So that was really, uh, I was I was at first concerned myself, but um, it was simply just <laughs> sending some emails and, and requesting specific documents. And uh, they were more than happy to uh, allow this to happen. That's awesome. And you note the Southern Appalachian Archives and Mars Hill University as the source for some of these archival materials. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what these archives that are so close to our home here. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a that was a surprise. Uh, 
Nina Paxton, uh, her archives are there, and it's just a couple of pieces. Uh, it's, uh, I, if I remember correctly, it's uh, a Time Magazine, uh, a letter to Time Magazine, a letter to uh, George Putnam, uh, Amelia Earhart's husband. She, Nina Paxton, uh, was a ham radio, or, you know, uh, amateur ham radio operator uh, and uh, would listen in the 30s would uh, as many many people were at that time because that was a, a form of an inter entertainment but also uh, to communicate with people around the world uh, around the country around the world um, and and she claims to have heard uh, Earhart distress signals uh, when, after she landed on uh, an island um, and based on what she could determine, um, if I'm re remembering correctly, <laughs> uh, is that she uh, seemed to have heard uh, certain words uh, that aligned with her being in the Marshall Islands, uh, Earhart being in the Marshall Islands. And so she, she wrote to George Putnam, she wrote to Time Magazine, and uh, she, uh, the, her archives are, are held in, in that uh, institution. That is awesome. <laughs> so how did you, how did you choose which archival materials to include in the exhibition? Uh, it was uh, to tell the story of the aftermath uh, that, you know, any of the elements that there were lots of things that I would, would, would want to include, but it just, I think it would, you'd be drowned with information if I put everything that I would have wanted to show here in the exhibition. Um, so I picked the things that could, from a, uh, a, not a literal timeline, but at least give sort of the beginning stages of the, the search to uh, sort of an ending of, of the search. So it was, elements or archival pieces that would help tell the story of the beginning and end and in between. So there are um, different pieces of, of correspondence between the U.S. Navy and uh, George Putnam, U.S. Navy and uh, the you know, other people on the president's staff and President Roosevelt himself. Uh, there are uh, uh, different things of that nature just to, uh, there are, uh, yeah, different things of that nature uh, that help tell that story. There's, uh, at the time, in the Marshall Islands, the Marshall Islands and Mariana Islands were all held by uh, the, the Japanese. After World War I, uh, the islands were handed to the Japanese for control. They weren't supposed to be building um, any military infrastructure at the time. Um, and they, uh, what am I trying to say here? <laughs> they, so there was, there was some correspondence between the US Navy and, and uh, the State Department and, and the, the Japanese Navy and, and Japanese State Department, um, where the, at that point, you know, the, there was, the Japanese were in fact building up uh, a military infrastructure in the area and weren't allowing the US, uh, US ships to actually go into the area. So they asked the Japanese to uh, search uh, as best they could. And the Japanese uh, did, uh, based on these, these correspondence, they did uh, do some searching of the areas that were part of their territory, wa territorial waters, um, and obviously came up with nothing. Uh, supposedly, um, the theory towards to uh, of this this theory of the Marshall Islands is that in fact she was captured by the by the Japanese. So one of the theories is that she landed on a small island in the Marshalls, and uh, on on the reef of of one of the islands in the Marshall Islands, and uh, was subsequently captured by uh, the Japanese. Whether she ran out of fuel, was running out of fuel and landed on a reef, or was forced down by the Japanese Navy, uh, that's not clear. Um, but uh, nonetheless, they landed on the reef and were captured by the Japanese and then taken uh, all the way back to Saipan, which is in the Mariana Islands, and uh, supposedly held in a prison, Yerapan prison on, on Saipan. 
where either she, um, her, her and her navigator, Fred Noonan, either uh, died of dysentery or were executed for being spies. Uh, so the, that's the, the story of this theory is that she was in fact captured by the Japanese and, and held for uh, a few years until whether she was executed or, uh, or, uh, or died of dysentery in, in this Japanese prison. Wow. Yeah, and, and I know we're running up on time here, but I did have one last question I wanted to ask you. Um, I know we have a lot of students in the audience and obviously there's a lot of travel and research involved with this project. And I wonder if you might be willing to share how you acquire funding and how you do fundraising for a project like this. Um, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of different things. Um, I initially had gotten uh, a grant uh, for this project. Uh, but it's also my own uh, funds, and it's also uh, trying to do uh, crowdfunding as well. Crowdfunding is is difficult. Uh, it's <laughs> crowdfunding is easier if you have an actual product in the end that you're going to be selling. Uh, when it's an art project, uh, smaller sums usually are are more successful than larger sums. Um, the project like this costs. Um, tens of thousands of dollars at, at, at different stages. Um, and so a lot of the time it's, it's selling work. It's, uh, you know, in my case, using my own funds to do this as well. I mean, it's a, I, I'm also an art director. Uh, I work for in advertising. Uh, and so there's, there's those, those funds of the, of that job, as well as uh, selling of the artwork that is uh, probably key to the, to the continuation of any of these projects, because they are so time consuming and um, complicated and, and uh, so far removed that they require a lot of uh, funding in that regard for the, for the travel itself. So it, it can be, it's, it's, it's difficult to fund uh, at, at these stages of a project. Um, I think once you have shown your uh, ability and that you're, you're capable of, of creating works of this nature, then it, it becomes a bit easier, but it's, it's not easy at all. Uh, it's, it's, it takes a lot of work. And like I said earlier, I, I spend a lot of time uh, writing grant proposals. So uh, that's, it's, that's, really key as well as to um, hone your skills in um, the, the, the writing of grants proposals, because that's going to be a, a significant part of the uh, process itself, for sure. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Matthew, for so graciously sharing your time and your work and your insights with us this evening. And thank you to everyone here for joining us and for sharing space with us on this digital platform. It's really nice to celebrate our exhibiting artists and to connect around their work and continue to cultivate community in these new ways. So be sure to check out our upcoming art talks on the Turchin Center's website. Uh, Christy will drop a link to that web page for you in the chat. And thank you again, everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate uh, being able to do this. I appreciate the Turchin Center and all you guys for uh, doing such hard work to get the, <laughs> this, this going. So I uh, thank you for, to everyone that has attended as well this tonight. Uh, it's really great. It's been great to do this. Yeah, it's been really nice having you. Thank you so much. We're hearing a lot of really nice uh, words of thanks to you, Matthew, from um, the rest of our staff at the Turchin Center. So um, on behalf of all of us, we're just really grateful to have your work with us and, um, and just being able to share. It's been really good. So thanks, Shauna, so much for leading us in that conversation. And thanks, everybody, for um, hanging in there and doing this digital uh, talk with us. <laughs> <laughs>